Hello everyone. I am Subodh V Modak, professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at IIT Delhi. This is the first lecture of my course on experimental model analysis. Uh, in this lecture today, I will introduce briefly the experimental model analysis and present uh, the relevant background of experimental model analysis. Uh, we will try to answer some uh, relevant questions like what is experimental model analysis, uh, what is vibration, why vibration occurs, what are the detrimental effects of vibration, that is why vibration needs to be reduced and finally we will try to present some motivations for experimental model analysis. Uh, so, before we proceed uh, to answer these questions, uh, let me first present a brief outline of this course. So, the course would start with uh, introduction and background, then you know we will try to lay a theoretical basis for experimental model analysis. Uh, understanding theoretical basis requires understanding of theoretical models or mathematical models of vibratory systems. Uh, and therefore, uh, the next topic would be that we will try to uh, look at what are lump parameter models of vibratory systems and you know how to develop governing equations of motion for these models. Uh, then we will look at uh, analytical model analysis of single degree of freedom systems in which we will cover the free and force vibrations of single degree of freedom undamped and damped systems. Then we will look at analytical model analysis of undamped multi degree of freedom systems and then analytical model analysis of damped multi degree of freedom systems. Uh, so, uh, in this uh, all topics we will also develop some important concepts like frequency response functions, uh, model space, uh, impulse response function and so on which are relevant to uh, understanding the experimental model analysis. Uh, then we will try to see uh, what are the important characteristics of frequency response functions and how they can be graphically presented. Uh, then we will look at uh, signal processing issues or signal processing for model analysis and we will try to uh, understand that how digital signal processing can be used to obtain the frequency domain representation of say response signal and the force signals and uh, some other pitfalls of the digital signal processing uh, like aliasing, uh, leakage, quantization error also we will discuss. Uh, then we will look at how FRFs can be measured on using impact hammer. Then we will look at FRF measurement using a vibration shaker or exciter. And then how the FRFs are then curve fitted to obtain modal parameters. So, we look at modal parameter estimation using frequency response functions and impulse response functions. Uh, depending upon the available time at the end, we will also try to uh, briefly look at phase resonance testing, operational analysis and some applications of experimental analysis. So, this is broadly the you know the topics we are going to cover in this course. So, let us uh, now address the first question uh, that is what is experimental model analysis. What is experimental model analysis? Uh, in order to understand what is experimental model analysis, I think we need to first understand what are natural modes of vibration. What are natural modes of vibration? So, the natural modes of vibration of a system are the principal or the distinct ways a system can vibrate naturally with harmonic motion, right. So, the natural modes are the uh, distinct ways by which system can vibrate harmonically. Uh, so, the system can vibrate naturally or 
um, freely, uh, which is not a natural mode of vibration, right? So free vibration, which is not a natural mode, is possible, right? But there are distinct f uh, ways in which a system can vibrate freely with harmonic motion. Uh, to take an example, let us uh, take example of a simple pendulum. Right. The simple pendulum, uh, if we disturb this pendulum, uh, let us say by keeping the amplitude of motion small, say like this, then uh, if it is displaced, then it is going to oscillate. So, this is the, it will go to the other extreme like this and then it will keep on oscillating like this. So, if theta is the amplitude of motion, right, and if theta is small, then it can be shown that this theta is a function of time uh, is uh, can be written as some theta naught times say cos omega and t okay and therefore the description of the displacement of the pendulum uh, is uh, can be described by a cosine function uh, if a different disturbance is given it can also be described by a sine function or a combination of sine and cos function but the important point is that the frequency of these motions is this which is nothing but the coefficient of time t and this frequency is same irrespective of way the, this pendulum is disturbed, uh, keeping of course the amplitude small uh, if and this frequency is called natural frequency. Simply because uh, the pendulum once disturbed is no longer excited further. So, it means it is under free vibration and the frequency in this state uh, you know is the natural frequency of the system. Uh, now, this pendulum uh, you know has only requires only one coordinate theta to specify its displaced configuration and therefore, this system is referred as a single degree of freedom system. And this is such a system and any single degree of freedom system has only one natural frequency, right. Uh, let us take another example. Let us take a system like this in which we are connecting two identical pendulums say by spring like this. Okay, so, there are two pendulums which are identical and we are connecting it by a spring. Uh, now, this system uh, has two degrees of freedom because uh, the displaced configuration of the two pendulums at any point of time, right, it requires two coordinates theta 1 and theta 2 to be specified so that the displaced configuration can be you know specified. So, this system has degree of freedom 2. Now, this system has two natural modes of vibration. One of the natural mode is this in which the two pendulums are displaced by an equal amount say uh, if I call it say theta naught theta naught. So, in this case this this uh, system is vibrates with natural frequency omega n 1 right. So, it means when the pendulum system goes to the other extreme of the cycle then they occupy a position like this ok they occupy a position like this. So, and they keep on oscillating like this. So, one of the important characteristics is that this uh, motion uh, number one it is harmonic motion and its frequency is the frequency of that motion 
of that natural motion is that is nothing but omega ion 1 the natural frequency and it is also seen that the uh, two pendulums they have a synchronous motion right so their amplitudes they are always in the same ratio at all times of time and this is another important characteristic of natural mode of vibration right so it means the two pendulums the displacement of the two pendulums they increase or decrease in the same proportion with time and this description of the displacement of the two pendulums of uh, you know in this particular in this mode of vibration uh, you know or in fact any mode of vibration is referred as the mode shape of that mode so it means we also have something called mode shape this i can say mode shape 1 right so this mode shape 1 basically prescribes that how the displacement of the two masses of the pendulum are going to change right how, how they are related rather right uh, and this is again uh, you know a property of this mode uh, so this is mode 1 so let me just write here this is mode 1 there is another mode natural mode of vibration which is possible for this system is which is in which the two pendulums they move uh, they move in the opposite direction they move out of they are their motion is out of phase like this so if this is um, say theta naught then this is so maybe uh, it's okay this is theta naught here so so therefore what is going to happen uh, the the motion of the two pendulums in this mode it's out of phase when one pendulum moves to the right the other pendulum moves to the left and when the uh, pendulum the other pendulum moves to the left the other one moves to the right uh, and this particular motion again is associated with a frequency and since it is the free vibration occurring in a specific mode we call it natural frequency right and the associated displacement shape is called mode shape and we call it let us say mode shape 2 and this mode is nothing but the second mode of vibration of the system ok. Uh, so therefore uh, we see that uh, these are the two natural modes of this system and there is no other you know way in which system can vibrate uh, such that it has harmonic motion there is no other way for example uh, if we uh, disturb the system keeping the amplitude of the first pendulum uh, zero and displace the other pendulum by some amount and relieve the system or release the system then this system is this vibration is also will also be a free vibration right it is also a free vibration but it is not in a particular mode right it is not either in the mode 1 or mode 2 and therefore uh, you know uh, it is not a natural mode of vibration. In fact the free vibration in this particular you know configuration or with this particular disturbance uh, can be shown to be a linear combination of the motions in mode 1 and mode 2. So therefore the natural modes are the principal uh, ways in which a system can vibrate naturally with harmonic motion right. So uh, a general disturbance given to a system also produces natural vibration or produces free vibration of the system right. However that free vibration is not purely in any mode of vibration it is not harmonic in nature it is a combination of several natural motions or the, uh, the natural motions in different modes natural modes of the system. Uh, the natural modes uh, therefore are associated with natural modes are associated with natural frequencies right for each mode there is a natural frequency then mode shapes for each mode there is a corresponding mode shape and in practical systems you see that there is also damping 
and damping uh, basically causes dissipation of energy and therefore each mode is also associated with what is called as damping factor so this something we'll discuss you know uh, in the lectures later so each mode is also associated with what is called as damping factor which prescribes how the uh, vibration uh, you know decays in that mode so therefore the natural modes are characterized by natural frequency mode shapes and damping factors uh, so the question is that uh, is it important to know this uh, you know characteristics of natural modes of a system uh, yes it is important because uh, the response of any system right the vibratory response of any system you know is determined by these natural modes these natural modes affect the response of a vibratory system to a given set of forces and hence it is important for us to know these natural modes so that uh, we can uh, then uh, you know uh, figure out or determine that how the vibration response can be reduced therefore identifying this characteristics is important and now we now come to our original question that what is experimental model analysis so experimental model analysis is an procedure for experimentally identifying these characteristics of natural modes for a given system so experimental model analysis which we can just abbreviate as ema uh, is a uh, is a, a method of or procedure of identifying a uh, model or dynamic characteristics right model or dynamic characteristics of a system and these characteristics natural frequencies mode shapes and damping factors they are also uh, commonly referred as modal or dynamic characteristics right so they are also referred as modal dynamic characteristics in short so uh, experimental analysis is a method of is a procedure of identifying modal or dynamic characteristics of a system experimentally uh so later we will look at what is the motivation uh, you know uh, for identifying these characteristics how do they help us we'll see later uh now another important thing we need to note is that the natural modes are defined for a linear system natural modes they are defined for a linear system and therefore uh, one of the mm, since model analysis is uh, related to identifying modal characteristics or characteristics of natural modes uh, it is clear that uh, one of the important assumptions in model analysis is that the system is linear okay so model analysis experimental analysis or model analysis assumes uh, the system to be linear okay so what our system is being analyzed it is assumed that that system is linear uh, and what is a linear system a system uh, is linear if it satisfies the principle of superposition right a system which satisfies the principle of superposition is a linear system and what is principle of superposition uh, let us represent a system by an input output model right in which we represent the system by a block that is the system 
and input of the system is represented by this arrow at the input and output uh, is represented by another arrow right which is the output. Uh, so let us suppose that we apply on this system an input uh, f1 let us say a force f1 is applied and let us say the response of the system is x1 right and let us also uh, say that if we apply input f2 let the response is x2 correct and if I apply the force f1 plus f2 right a combination of these two forces and if the response is x okay uh, so the principle of superposition says that uh, if x is equal to x1 plus x2 right so the output due to the combined forces if that is equal to the algebraic sum of the output due to individual forces if that is so then the principle of superposition is satisfied and system is said to be linear okay so that is the basic idea of a linear system uh, now in practice many systems uh, have some degree of non linearity and you know, but the important thing is that the uh, many systems uh, can be approximated as linear for small amplitudes of motion. Uh, to understand this, let me uh, take the example of let us say a system with a non-linear stiffness, right? So, if I take the example of non-linear stiffness, a system with a non-linear stiffness, then uh, uh, what is mean by non-linear stiffness? That if we plot let us say if we apply the force on the system and record its uh, displacement right uh, so let us say record its displacement x and if we plot this then uh, the behavior may be something like this so we know that the relationship between the force and displacement is non linear and the stiffness is basically nothing but the uh, uh, first derivative of uh, you know force with a displacement right or which also we can roughly write as delta f by delta x. So basically the stiffness of the system is the slope of this curve force deflection curve at any particular value of x and we can see from this figure that uh, in the lower range the slope is different and if we go up the displacement the slope is different right you can see the slopes are different uh, for different values of x so this system is a non linear stiffness uh, but if the range of operation of the system right uh, is such that the amplitudes encountered are small the displacement of the system is small uh, so let us say if the system is operating in this range right so it's operating in this range uh, with this much displacement then uh, we see that uh, the force deflection characteristics can be approximated by a straight line in this range and we can uh, treat uh, the system uh, as approximately linear right we can treat the system as linear and therefore the model analysis uh, principles can be applied for analysis of this system uh, so therefore we see that uh, uh, many systems in practice will have some degree of non linearity however still in practice the model analysis uh, you know and experimental analysis is widely used uh, you know uh, because for small range of motions the systems though maybe uh, you know the uh, the uh, non linear systems also behave more or less like linear systems right the developments in model analysis uh, experimental model analysis were motivated by need to reduce vibration levels higher dynamic response and therefore one of the important goals of experimental model analysis is uh, reduction of vibration in systems and structures. 
so let us try to address uh, you know some relevant background of this you know vibration that what is vibration what is vibration so vibration is nothing but the oscillatory motion and we are dealing with physical systems and hence we can say that it is nothing but the oscillatory motion of a physical system right. So vibration is nothing but the oscillatory motion right of course of a physical system. And when we say oscillatory motion, uh, motion means basically uh, you know the parameters like displacement, velocity, acceleration, these are the parameters which characterize the motion of a system, right. So, therefore, when we prescribe the displacement or velocity or acceleration or uh, you know all of them as a function of time, then basically we are prescribing the vibration of a system, okay. So, the oscillatory motion is prescribed in terms of the displacement as a function of time velocity is a function of time. So, uh, 1 dot over x represents velocity, 2 dots represent acceleration okay because velocity is the first derivative of x and acceleration is the second derivative of x. And therefore, we put 1 dot or 2 dot depending upon the number of times we are differentiating the displacement. So, the oscillatory motion can be described in this manner. Uh, but we should also remember that uh, this is not the only kind of oscillations which occur in nature. For example, oscillations occur also in acoustic systems, right? Oscillation of acoustic systems. So, the sound uh, is nothing but the acoustic oscillation. Uh, any pressure fluctuation in, in any medium, typically the air that is nothing but the fluctuation of air and that you know changes with time. So, that is oscillation of the air and that is oscillation of the acoustic pressure. Uh, we also have oscillations in electrical circuits, right. Oscillations in electrical systems. For example, we have all studied you know RLC circuit. So, if you uh, give a uh, input voltage to the circuit which is oscillatory, then the current produced in the circuit is also oscillatory, right. And in fact, the supply we get you know in our households is an alternating current supply. So, uh, therefore, the voltage being you know delivered uh, to the households is alternating in nature and therefore, the current it generates is also alternating. So, there are you know oscillations. However, we are, we are uh, in restricting ourselves to oscillations of a uh, physical system described by displacement, velocity, and acceleration, right, which we call as vibration. So the next, uh, you know, obvious question is that why do vibration occur? Why do vibrations occur? Uh, Vibration occurs because of the dynamic forces, right? They occur because the dynamic forces they act on the system. Uh, let us again look at the input output model of a system. So, let us say we have a force F x on this, right? And if the force is static, which means that it stays constant with time. So, this is nothing but a static force. Then the displacement it produces uh, in the under the steady state right uh, that is also you know constant with time ok. It is also constant with time. Of course, there may be some initial transient which we may you know ignore at the moment. So, there would be uh, so displacement is constant with time. So, you have a static displacement right or st static deformation. Uh, 
Uh, but let us take the case where this force is not static, right? The force we have is let us say varying with time, say something like this, like a cosine wave. Then we see that the displacement it produces also you know is going to vary with the time at the same frequency and what we see is that because the force here is varying the x displacement x is also varying. So it means the system goes away from its static position to some extreme it returns back and goes to other some other extreme on the other side and this process repeats and that is nothing but oscillation. So you can see this is nothing but the oscillatory motion. and nothing but vibration okay so uh, we understand that therefore uh, if the force is you know oscillatory and such forces we refer as dynamic forces right dynamic forces uh, which vary with time they produce what is called as vibration or we can also call it as dynamic response the response is also dynamic. Uh, the dynamic forces uh, need not be you know very only in this uh, manner like shown here like cosine wave. No, they can be much more you know very in a much more arbitrary and random manner right. For example, the forces may be like this. So that is also a dynamic force. And the vibration uh, it would produce would also be, uh, you know, look uh, would be quite quite, quite uh, irregular and varying in a quite random manner like this. So depending upon the forces that are acting, the vibration or the produced uh, will be, uh, you know, uh, depending on that, right? Uh, so therefore, the vibration occurs because of dynamic forces. But what are the origins of the dynamic forces? What are the you know sources of dynamic forces in practice? So, what are the sources of dynamic forces? Uh, so one of the important source is rotating unbalance force due to rotating unbalance. Uh, so many machines you know they have rotating elements right like you know for example turbines, fans, compressors, centrifugal compressors right, motors, generators. So there are many you know uh, machines. Uh, which have rotating elements okay uh, and these rotating elements you know uh, they have generally their center of mass we would ideally like that the center of mass of the rotating element is at its axis of rotation but that is very difficult to you know satisfy right that is very difficult to achieve so if this is the you know let us say rotating element right on this shaft and therefore what is happened let us say this is the center of mass. So the center of mass may not be exactly at the axis of rotation. So this distance is called eccentricity right and then what happens this if the m is the mass if m is the mass of the this rotating element then and if the angular velocity is omega then m into e into omega square is the centrifugal force that it creates right and this force is a rotating force and that is why you can see it is going to change direction. So it means it has two components this is one component and this is another component. So let us say uh, you know if the time t is equal to 0 coincides with this axis then this angle is omega t and therefore this force 
will be m e omega square cos omega t and this force will be m e omega square sin omega t. So effectively what is going to happen? You have basically two forces acting on the whole system because this force finally will be transferred, will be acting on the shaft carrying the rotating element and shaft being supported in bearings, the force will be transferred to the bearings right in the form of reactions. So, and then the reaction, those bearings are mounted in the housing in the machine, so that forces will be transmit, uh, transmitted to the housing of the machine, right. So effectively what is going to happen that machine is going to shake because of these forces. So that is why you know uh, and then in turn the whole machine and different elements of it will be set into vibration. So therefore rotating unbalance is a very common cause of vibrations in structures and machines. Uh, another uh, source is reciprocating unbalance. Right. So uh, many machines have reciprocating parts. For example, IC engines. Right. They have a slider kind mechanism, and therefore, if I show here, this is the slider or the piston, and this is the connecting rod, and then we have. this is the uh, connecting rod, crank and then the bearing right crankshaft. So therefore this is the piston which is reciprocating and this connecting rod has a you know superposition of two kinds of motion reciprocating motion because it is connected to piston and on the other end is connecting to the crank which is purely having a pure rotation. So it is a combination of rotation and reciprocating motion. So therefore some mass of the connecting rod also uh, can be uh, considered to have reciprocating motion. So what happens is uh, because of this reciprocating mass it is being continuously you know uh, accelerated right. So the piston you know on the two extremes it has velocity 0 right and then it has to reach from one point one end to other end. So therefore it has to be accelerated and again it has to be retarded. So because of that you know the inertia forces are generated and that basically then cause uh, you know the, um, the uh, this causes uh, the dynamic force and a dynamic couple right. So the, this inertia force due to receiving parts it leads to a dynamic force acting on the frame supporting this you know mechanism and a shaking couple which is a dynamic couple right. So it basically leads to dynamic force and dynamic couple. So they vary with time and then go, going to you know uh, cause the vibration of the whole that machine. So wherever you are receiving parts and if they are not completely balanced then the unbalance, receiving unbalance will lead to these forces. Uh, then we have operating forces right. So machines when they you know they are operating so because of the operation of the machine depending upon the kind of machine the forces may be generated right. For example in metal cutting say metal cutting say in a you know milling machine right. So when the milling cutter removes the material from the, surf, from the, from the surface of a plate let us suppose then it applies cutting forces right. And those forces uh, generated in cutting they act not only on the workpiece but they also act on the milling cutter or the tool right cutting tool and cutting tool is held in a tool post that is also subjected to those forces and then the whole body of the machine is also subjected to the forces. And because these forces again are dynamic they are not static forces they vary with time. And therefore the whole machine and different parts of it are subjected to these time varying dynamic forces which may lead to the vibration of the workpiece, the tool and the rest of the machine. So that again is undesirable right. Uh, the other example is for example the forces in forging right, in a forging machine, in a forging machine uh, the hammer applies a very huge impact force on the workpiece to produce the forge. Uh, and um, it is a very uh, you know very high impact force right in a short time a very huge amount of force is applied. 
and that basically shakes the whole machine the foundation on which the machine is installed and you know therefore it causes the vibration uh, so so therefore in other machines also because of the operational forces uh, because of the operation some forces might be generated which will cause vibration of the machine uh, the there may be ambient forces right there may be ambient forces uh, for example uh, one of the ambient force is wind right wind loading this is specially you know um, uh, quite prominent in case of uh, forces on civil engineering structures like a tall building subjected to you know wind right so wind blows and the velocity uh, of the wind uh, you know changes so because of that the load on the building because of the wind uh, is basically uh, changes with time and therefore it basically is a, causes a dynamic load on the building and that may shake the building and other example is uh, earthquake right so earthquake basically is relative motion between the different layers of the earth crust and that relative motion is again transient in nature it occurs for a short time there is a sudden slip between different layers right so there is a continuous activity under the earth and uh, because of that there is some relative movement that might takes place right uh, and that basically is then uh, you know x like a um, transient ground motion right and all the structures which are there on the ground they are subjected to that transverse uh, you know transient motion uh, which basically is like a you know momentary uh, big you know displacement of the foundation of different those structures and which causes their vibration so that again therefore is dynamic in nature uh, waves in sea for example is another you know source of ambient loading uh, which is uh, basically relevant for ships right uh, so therefore waves uh, they impinge on the hull of a ship and they excite the hull causing its vibration another ambient excitation could be acoustic right so whenever um, there are sound waves acoustic waves or basically the uh, waves created in any any medium it could be like air or water or i mean liquid or solid also so the waves uh, created in this any of the medium are basically they travel they propagate in different directions and these are nothing but acoustic waves and therefore especially the waves created in air they uh, can impinge or they do impinge on the structures uh, with which they come into contact and those structures in turn are subjected to the acoustic pressure and because pressure is fluctuating the load uh, you know generated because of these waves on the structures are also fluctuating and hence uh, constitute dynamic forces on those structures so therefore the sound also can you know sound or acoustic waves can also excite the structures uh, then uh, there could be also you know uh, due to uh, fluid flow right in pipes and ducts so mm, many systems machines have fluid uh, flowing in pipes and ducts right so uh, the turbulence in the flow right that creates uh, forces on the walls of the pipe and duct uh, because of the variation in the geometry may also lead to forces so all those effects may also cause excitation of the structure of the pipe right and mm, and vibrate it uh, even uh, if there is a flow of fluid right fluid flow past a body right or structure that also may excite the structure so one example is that if we have a, let us say a pillar pillar of a bridge right in the uh, in a river for example so so what happens uh, so there may be a there may be formation of eddies due to the flow right so mm, this is the fluid flow at some velocity and because of this the mm, uh, there may be formation of 
uh, eddies like this here. So these eddies uh, which uh, you know generate due to turbulence due to the uh, obstruction placed in the path of the flow, uh, these eddies may excite the pillar and then this pillar may vibrate in this direction. So this is often referred as self excited vibration. Uh, so I think these are some of the you know sources or the origins uh, you know for a appearance of dynamic forces on machines and structures which excite the system. Uh, so now the question is that is this vibration undesirable? Does it have any detrimental effect on the machines and structures? So let us try to look at uh, that how this vibration affects machines and structures. So let us look at what are its detrimental effects. So one of the most uh, important effect of vibration is that it causes fatigue of the uh, system which is undergoing vibration right fatigue and how the vibration leads to fatigue to understand this let us take a simple example uh, let us say we have a motor electric motor mounted on a bracket uh, right and bracket is uh, fixed to the wall and it is supporting and let us say the bracket is in the form of a, is you know in the form of a short cantilever and we have this electric motor mounted on the bracket like this like this right and as we said before that mm, rotating elements uh, you know they will have some inherent unbalance left so uh, whatever efforts are made to balance the rotating uh, part of that you know uh, say the motor uh, still it would not be possible to completely balance it or to eliminate the unbalance completely right. Uh, so therefore there would be some unbalance in the uh, armature of the motor and when the motor rotates that a centrifugal force is generated which causes excitation right uh, which generates leads to an excitation force in the both directions right in the vertical and the horizontal direction and if I focus at my attention on the say the force created in the vertical direction which we can call as m e omega square say uh, sin omega t right if omega is the speed of uh, uh, speed of the motor then this is the centrifugal force uh, this is the excitation force created on the system right and now what is going to happen this force is going to vary like this with time okay and this bracket is therefore subjected to vibration so this bracket is going to vibrate in this manner right if let us say this is the mean position of the bracket right then uh, in the the upward direction it goes to this extreme right and then in the mm, downward direction it goes to this extreme like this okay and if we focus our attention on let us say uh, a fiber let us say this is the this is the neutral axis of the this cantilever and if we focus our attention on let us say this fiber which is at a certain distance from the neutral axis right and let us call this fiber as 1 2 right so therefore this fiber when the bracket is moving up will take this position right and this fiber will be under compression right there would be a longitudinal compressive strain in the fiber its length would reduce because it is above the neutral axis and the bracket is moving up so it is going to have a negative strain and negative strain or compressive strain will lead to a compressive stress minus sigma when the bracket moves to the lower side 
in the next cycle in the next half of the cycle then the position of the fiber will be somewhere here and in this position the length of the fiber will increase okay from its uh, you know length or unloaded length right unstretched length and it would lead to a tensile strain and therefore a tensile stress uh, therefore uh, if we now plot the let us say the stress in this fiber 2 right 1 2 as a function of time then uh, we are likely to we will basically we are looking at this kind of picture right we are looking at this kind of picture so it means it has negative stress then in the one half cycle in the next half cycle it has positive stress negative stress positive stress so you, we, we uh, can easily see that this fiber is subjected to alternating you know positive and negative stresses and that is nothing but fatigue right so that is nothing but the fatigue because we know that the uh, uh, fatigue occurs if if a uh, you know any structure is loaded you know uh, with a alternating load right or a varying load so any load which varies on the structure leads to variable displacement variable stresses variable strengths and uh, and therefore uh, you know the uh, what is the ill effect of that that the life of the that structure or system that would be less than the case if the load were uh, static so the fatigue therefore it reduces the life so the vibration leads to fatigue and fatigue reduces the life and therefore uh, that is one reason why vibrations are undesirable because they would lead to systems and structures with lesser life uh, another uh, uh, you know effect is that they lead to reduced you know life of bearings also because finally what happens the dynamic loads which are generated they are finally transmitted to you know supporting surfaces uh, when we have rotating elements or respecting elements we have some bearings right so they will be subjected to higher levels of dynamic forces and therefore the life of those bearings also will reduce uh, another detrimental effect is that uh, it may may lead to increase friction wear and tear so often uh, you know higher levels of vibration uh, they hinder with the relative motion of uh, different elements of a system and which may lead to increased level of friction right and therefore higher wear and higher tear of those elements uh, it also leads to you know reduced performance it may also lead to reduced performance for example uh, in measure in, uh, in instruments and measuring systems if there are vibrations then the accuracy of measurement uh, is likely to reduce and you know therefore the performance of the system reduces uh, in machine tools for example which are mean for you know uh, metal cutting or mass pro or production uh, so again vibration will lead to drop in the accuracy of machining so therefore in general the vibration in systems and structures they, it leads to uh, reduced performance uh, reduce ride comfort in passenger vehicles right so another uh, ill effect is that in passenger vehicles like say uh, automobiles you know uh, railway or aeroplane any passenger you know you know transportation system right transportation vehicle you how uh, if vibrations are there the ride comfort will reduce right we do not want uh, you know vibration beyond a certain you know limit and if uh, you know vibrations are higher the right comfort is sacrificed uh, the vibration also often leads to increased noise increased uh, 
noise. So one of the mechanisms of noise generation or sound generation is the vibration, right? Vibration of surfaces. And therefore, if machines have vibration, they often lead to radiate a lot of noise. And that is something undesirable. Uh, so these are basically uh, the detrimental effects of vibration. But then uh, are there you know, any um, advantages of vibration in any cases? Is vibration desirable in any circumstances? Uh, uh, some applications of vibrations are So, vibration phenomena uh, is also used for some you know productive purpose. For example, in case of uh, musical systems, in some musical systems vibrations are induced to generate uh, you know music or you know sound right which is uh, desirable. For example, in an acoustic guitar. In acoustic guitar, uh, the vibration of string, you know, is generated. Uh, by the string is set into vibration to produce, you know, the sound. Right? The vibration of string is transmitted via its supports to the box of the guitar, uh, which in turn, you know, then you know, vibrates and causes oscillations in the air inside the box, which leads to acoustic modes being excited of that box, which then in turn, you know, produces sound. So, therefore, here the vibration is intentionally induced to produce the you know uh, certain music. Uh, vibratory conveyors, uh, right, is another application where a small amount of vibration is you know given to a conveyor uh, to push forward the granular material kept on the conveyor. So, the vibration is used for you know uh, transportation of granular material. Uh, Vibration exciter is another application. We will also study and use vibration exciter for model testing. So, vibration exciter is used to intentionally subject an object or a product to vibration. So, one of the application of vibration exciter is in acceptance testing, where uh, especially the electronic equipment, right, electronic uh, you know PCB boards, etc. They need to be tested uh, for their you know ability to sustain the harsh environments in which the machine etc in which they are to be installed are supposed to operate. And therefore, in advance in the laboratory we subject those you know electronic equipment to certain levels of vibrations which they are supposed to encounter in practice and test whether uh, you know test their integrity and their ability to sustain the vibrations without uh, sustaining any failure. Uh, so therefore, uh, that is one application. Other application is in the model testing where we would like to excite the structure uh, with the intention of identifying the characteristics of its natural modes, right? So that is another application. So I think these are some of the applications of vibration. However, in most engineering systems, uh, generally the vibration is undesirable, right? So it is undesirable in most engineering systems. Most engineering systems. Uh, vibrations is undesirable. Right? And it is desired that the, um, um, the vibration amplitude right, is less than or equal to the permissible vibration level. that is what is desired and a permissible level of vibration is set based on uh, the safety of the equipment in mind uh, the performance you know requirements in mind so those are the basically you know um, inputs uh, which allow us to determine or fix the permissible vibration levels right and then the it is desired that the that in system or structure is designed such that the vibration levels it encounters or experiences in practice under the action of operating forces, uh, it is less than the permissible level. That is the basically what is being uh, targeted for. 
and so so this basically requires that the uh, the design of the system is dynamically sound right so when does uh, that occur the design of the system or structure is dynamically sound and what is mean by dynamically sound design the design is such that uh, its, uh, its characteristics right its model characteristics dynamic characteristics they are favorable uh, uh, which means that when the dynamic forces act on the system or structure uh, it does not unduly amplify their effect and produces a higher level of dynamic response right so the dynamics of the uh, system or structure has to be tuned in such a manner that when the dynamic forces act in practice it does not unduly you know amplify their effect right and does not produce an output which is beyond the permissible level so such a design we refer as dynamic sound design and modern analysis plays an important role in achieving this objective achieving the objective of dynamically sound design because model analysis basically allows us to study the characteristics of system uh, so let us try to see what are the uh, motivations uh, you know for model analysis need of model analysis need of experimental model analysis right <clears throat> so i will present two motivations right to understand that why experimental model analysis is important so let me also write here need of model analysis or experimental model analysis right so the first motivation is in studying the or avoiding rather uh, the resonant operations right it's in the avoidance of resonant operations of machines and structures uh, now why resonant operation needs to be avoided why it needs to be avoided to understand this let me take uh, the example of a simple system and let us say we have a machine right uh, subjected to dynamic forces and let us uh, you know represent a machine by a model of the machine and i am using here what is called as a single degree of freedom model of the machine so later in the later lectures we are going to talk more about the models right and what is a single degree of freedom system or a model all those things we will talk in more detail but let us say this is a model of the machine and the machine is represented by a mass m stiffness k and damping coefficient c and let us say the machine is being acted upon by a dynamic force of uh, uh, you know uh, of nature f not cos omega t right and let us say uh, the displacement of the machine is x in the vertical direction and and let us say it is given by x of t uh, and also we would uh, you know see that this displacement is basically governed by omega t minus phi so the if uh, we if we analyze this system we would come to know that the displacement is given by x of t x not cos omega t omega t minus phi which means the frequency of the displacement or the vibration is same as that of the frequency of the force and the amplitude of the displacement is x not and it has a phase angle phi with respect to the force right so let us look at the variation of uh, the amplitude of the displacement with the frequency of the external force and this variation looks something like this uh, so when omega is equal to 0 the amplitude of displacement is what is called as x static or static deflection right so x static is equal to f not upon k 
So, when omega is 0, uh, the frequency, the force is no longer a dynamic force, it is a static force, it is acting in the same direction, right. So, it produces a static deflection and the k has units of Newton per meter and hence f naught upon k gives us the static deflection. But when omega coincides or is close to the resonant frequency of the system, right, then we see a very large amplitude. So, x naught is very large. And this condition is called resonance. So, when resonance occurs, the amplitude of displacement or vibration is very large and it would lead to higher fatigue you know stresses and a larger you know reduction in the life and larger damage it would induce and hence resonance needs to be avoided. Uh, but the resonance can be avoided only when we know what is the natural frequency right then only we can avoid the resonance. So, that uh, because if we know the excitation frequency then and then if the natural frequency is known then we would be able to figure out whether the resonance is likely to occur or not. So, therefore, uh, to avoid resonance we must know what is resonance and then uh, experimental model analysis can be used, uh, EMA can be used to identify resonant frequencies. right and avoid resonant operation. So, this is one of the principal motivation for uh, experimental analysis. Uh, the other motivation uh, is in troubleshooting vibration and noise problems. Uh, let us suppose our objective is to know what is the cause of higher vibration level right. So, we want to know what is the cause of higher vibration level. What is the cause? Uh, so, one way could be that we measure the vibration and try to analyze the vibration and see that you know uh, try to you know figure out or determine that what could be the cause, but that could be a difficult you know proposition. To understand that again let us take the system input output model right. right and if the system is represented by let us say frequency response function alpha omega if the input is represented by f of omega in the frequency domain and output is represented by x of omega in the frequency domain. So, these are the descriptions of the force system and output in the frequency domain. Then uh, we see that uh, the in the frequency domain x of omega is equal to alpha of omega into f of omega ok. If you multiply the input with the system characteristics defined by frequency response function then we get the output of the system right in the frequency domain. And now let us say if we have higher output which means the vibrations are higher. So, you have higher output. Now, the higher output uh, could be due to a higher input right that is higher uh, f of omega or it could be due to unfavorable unfavorable uh, frequency response function right or system correct unfavorable system characteristics.
Okay. So, higher output could be due to higher input or unfavorable FRF or system characteristics. So, if we have information only about the output of the system, then it would not be possible to reach to a definitive answer about whether the higher output is due to higher input or is it due to unfavorable system characteristics. So, therefore, if we can identify the system, we can analyze the system and know its the, you know the characteristics, then by analysis of the interaction between the input and the system, it we can reach to a more you know definitive conclusion about the cause of the higher vibration levels. And once the cause uh, is uh, you know identified, then uh, the measures to mitigate the vibrations can be planned and you know the measures can be determined right so this is another important motivation for you know uh, experimental model analysis right that it will help us to troubleshoot vibration and noise problems therefore today we covered uh, the basic introduction to experimental model analysis and we tried to answer some basic questions like what is experimental model analysis what is the need of experimental model analysis and some relevant background like vibrations, causes of vibration and statimental effect. Uh, so, in the next lecture, uh, we would again further continue uh, with little more uh, you know background uh, right and then we will uh, start with the second topic of you know mathematical models of vibratory systems. So, thank you. <laughs>